Hi, and welcome back to our theatre highlight series. Today, we have the pleasure of Rich Fenton, Senior Theatre Consultant at Marshall Day, joining us. And uh, Richard, thanks for coming along and thanks for uh, for chatting us to, to us today. Thanks for having me. Excellent. It's, it's really great to have you here. So, I just kind of wanted to start off and ask you about your experience and what you've been doing over, over the past few years and in, in your career. So, um, I have worked, I've been lucky to work at some pretty well-known places. Um, I probably started off mainly doing uh, touring things. I did a fair bit of work for Norwest Productions. Um, and companies like that. But then uh, I worked for the Sydney Opera House for 10 years. Um, I started there as a just a casual sound technician and became uh, one of the first full-time audio supervisors at the Opera House. Um, so I did a lot of you know rostering and um, acting in head of department when the head of department was away and a whole bunch of things like that. And then from there, I went to Singapore and I was head of sound at Marina Bay Sands. Um, and then acted in a technical manager role for a while there as well. Well, and then now <laughs> I am obviously at Marshall Day as a senior theatre consultant. Yeah, so um, I mean that's it. You know, it's pretty uh, varied in the in the way that you've you've kind of progressed through your roles, mm. and uh, obviously starting out in Norwest and then moving to somewhere like the Opera House, that it, it's. Not, I don't want to say chalk and cheese, but certainly a, a difference in the type of role. So yes, mm. it's, it's production, but you know you're, you're going from what's essentially more of a bump in, bump out style gig to yeah. a now installed kind of bump in, bump out style gig. Yeah. So how how different was that for you moving from those those different roles? It was very different. So Norwest, as you know, does a lot of amazing things and they have a lot of really great uh, creative people doing a lot of really cool technical things. Um, but you know, as you can imagine, a lot of the casual employees, you don't really get much of a chance to do that kind of stuff. You're more just like, put it up, make sure it works, uh, do the best job you can and then bump it out and get it back to the factory. Um, going to somewhere like the opera house that, uh, has the ability to produce some of its own shows and work really closely with producing companies. You got much more of a chance to be involved with creating uh, technology that worked for the show and to be in- involved with making a piece of art work rather than kind of just coming in, making it happen and then leaving. Um, you got much more of an interaction with, uh, you know, directors and um, creative people and um, yeah, just being involved with actually making a show um, rather than moving gear, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> yeah, push, pushing boxes, right? <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah, no, that's great. And I, I mean, you know, being involved in the in the creative side, and especially from a technology perspective, would be quite a good challenge as well, because mm. you're then going out and trying to make this work for the job that you're that might be in there for either a night or it might be in there for a yeah, season. So totally would be, would be quite good. And and in terms of being able to have that opportunity to to be the head of a department when that that those opportunities arose, how was that different to your normal everyday role? Um, yeah, being the head of department gets you to see things with a much broader scope. I think um, so. Obviously, I was head of department at Marina Bay Sands, and that was my entire job. Um, but one of the things I did when I was at the Opera House is I acted as head of department for the Vivid Festival, which is a big, as you know, it's a big festival that occurs. Um, and you got much more of an overview of seeing how all of the different shows come together and how everything works and how all the equipment moves together. When you're on the floor doing a show, you can you can get frustrated and be like, oh, I don't have this piece of gear I need or why can't I have this or what's going on? But when you're looking at the overall production of like 15 different shows going on at the same time, you have much more of a wider scope of like, seeing how everything interacts and how, you know, if you take a piece of equipment from here, then it can't go there. Um, we had a thing in Vivid in particular because we just had so much equipment going around the building. There wasn't actually any more equipment we could sub hire in. So um, the when Lou Reed curated the festival, his monitor speaker of choice was a DMB M2. We literally had every single DMB M2 in the country. And when he asked for more one day, um, we were just kind of like, <laughs> well, I'm sorry, there isn't actually any more in the country. Yeah, and he was yeah like, that's right. Oh, okay, because we'd sub hired all of them in. Um, and so, yeah, just dealing with things that pop up and and uh, kind of combating 
all the day to day last minute things that happen and, and just sort of trying to facilitate the, all the different shows going on at once um, is a great kind of overarching view of how complicated a multi arts venue can be. And a lot of the time, even though you're working in a multi arts venue, you don't really see that because you're doing your show. Um, yeah, de- definitely. I mean, that's it. It sounds like a very challenging environment in in some in some circumstances, uh, but but certainly fulfilling, I would assume. Oh yeah, it was great. It was awesome fun. Yeah, um, excellent. It's definitely one of the best jobs I've ever done. That's great fun. Yeah. Mm. And then what about now? So you've moved from you know heading up a department at a you know a large events style center to to now being a consultant for you know the the theater industries and, and theater buildings. How has that changed your point of view in in terms of technology and going into theaters? Um, there's a lot more uh, kind of thought that goes into fitting out a venue and making technology work in a venue in the very early stages. And I think when I was, you know, when I was a technician or when I was a head of department, I would come in and see something and I'd be like, ah, consultant, such an idiot. Why did they do that? And now that I am a consultant, I'm like, ah, they did that because engineering couldn't move this and architecture couldn't move that. And then the facilities had to put this here. And that was the only possible solution. Um, So it gives you much more of a of an understanding how the whole thing works. So as a consultant, we work a lot with uh, with the architects. So architects will come up with a, a design and then they'll consult with us um, on everything from just building flow to um, technology and how it interfaces with the building and, and systems like that. So we're working on a project at the moment um, where it's a multi-arts venue going in um, regional Western Australia and um, we're looking at simple things like how do you get a truck in? How do you get cases from here to there? Once the cases are on stage, where are they going to store the empties? Things that an architect hasn't really ever had to think about and yep. shouldn't really because they haven't done gigs before. Um, you know, if you have a performer on stage, how quickly can, can they get to their dressing room for a quick change? Or if they can't, where would you put a quick change? Things like that. Um, yeah. looking at a much broader scope to the building than I've ever had to look at before. Cause generally I've been in a building that already exists. So, yep. um, that kind of, those kind of decisions were never really available to me, but now we're looking at buildings on a plan and, you know, today we're like, oh, let's move the lobby here and let's put the waste disposal unit over there. And then that makes much better access to the dressing rooms, <laughs> you know, <laughs> things like that, that we never really would get a chance to do. Um, I've definitely, you know, being a consultant has taught me how important having a consultant in early stages of a building is. Yep. And and so from from that perspective, are you, you you're obviously dealing with the architect and and you know they're they're obviously designing the building, the yeah. floor of the building. Are you also um, in a heavy consultation with the? owners or whoever is looking after the build for the theater or whoever will eventually look after that build for the theater yeah we definitely try to be um so you mean like who the end user will be yeah yeah who yeah. The end user will so be. that's yeah. definitely one of the first people that we try and get in contact with um sometimes they don't even have that person in existence yet um and so that can be a little challenging but sometimes there's builds um that you know they've hired technical people or they know that um for example a local theater production company is going to be the resident venue you know the resident company at that venue um and so we'll get in contact with that and them and see exactly what they do and how they do it and what the best way we can facilitate with them is so um i'm very much a believer that the more you know, consulting that you have with the end user, the better your result will be. And that's largely from being an end user who didn't get consulted a few times and the projects turned yep. to be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so. yeah, definitely. And and so do you tend to also look after other existing, so consulting for existing theatres or are you more yeah. looking at, yeah, yeah. And and how, it, how does that differ from, because obviously you've got a fixed space as opposed to something that's, you know, pliable as such. Mm. How does that differentiate the way that you look at the, the space? Um, I suppose it's, a, it's, 
much more fixed in what you can do in general. Um, what we do a lot with existing theatres is we do uh, what we kind of call a venue health check where we will go and talk to um, often, you know, more regional venues, um, but, you know, we've done it with for bigger venues in major cities before and basically go, most of your technology is you know, 8, 10, 12 years old, whatever. Yep. It's probably time Antiquated. to do an upgrade. Yeah. Um, can we help you specify that, work out how to implement that and, and work out what the best equipment for your your venue is? Um, so a lot of our existing kind of venue work is, um, is more technical based of helping them to upgrade their sound system, lighting systems, technical systems, whatever. Um, and then there's also... Uh, a lot of venues that there is a venue and then they're doing renovations and building on with that. So we'll be involved in that, which once again has architects involved and designing things and yeah. Yeah. So, so multiple stakeholders in there all wanting their own yeah. way of doing a certain thing. Yeah. Pretty much. It which, is funny which sometimes has you have to, to tell people yeah. like, ah, oh, that's just simply not going to work. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and talking about those types of challenges, I mean, is there is there like specific challenges you face when you're designing these new theatre spaces? Um, some of the challenges will be that you know um, equipment space and storage space hasn't been allowed for, but we've been brought in too late in the project, and you know the concrete started to be poured or something like that, and they're like, well, we can't change that now. You'll just have to come up with a new solution. And so there's a lot of kind of trying to jerry-rig spaces to make them work um, if we haven't been able to have input early on in the project. Um, and the same with technical infrastructure and, um, you know, even simple things like uh, touring venues that are wanting to receive theatre touring shows, but they have no way of getting a multi from front of house to stage because no one has thought about it. Um, and generally... Yeah. Uh, infrastructure people or architects will be like, well, but we're putting in all this cabling, all this patching. And I'm like, yeah, but a touring show won't care about that. They have their core and they want to run it. Um, yep. And so a lot of that kind of stuff can be forgotten and then you get brought in too late and you're kind of trying to make a solution that no one really wants to hear. <laughs> that, yeah. that can be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And and so in terms of the the types of I guess infrastructure that you're putting into these spaces, is it are you seeing more of a more of the spaces heading towards, you know, ethernet based, you know, cabling and fiber and so forth in order to be able to to get around rather definitely. than, you know, traditional mic cable and stuff. Yeah, yeah, we're putting in less and less um, you know, standard kind of analog cabling in venues. Um in a lot of kind of smaller school venues we're not really putting in any at all we're just sort of you know suggesting um solutions based on like cat six or whatever technology so something like dante or um you know even consoles like alan and heath have their um let's call the s-link and uh yamaha runs dante and all those kind of different consoles they just run cat six or cat five or cat five e or whatever um for their cause and so it saves you know not many people know that it actually costs quite a lot of money to run an analog cable and terminate it um so it saves the client a lot of money in the end and they just plug in a you know plug in one box at one end and plug in one box at the other end um and you have that kind of solution uh, but then there's obviously other venues that need that versatility of analog patching and in talking to the clients, that's exactly what we do for them. We, you know, we yep. suggest analog cabling and we um, document that up for them. But yeah, for sure, there is lo lots and lots of um, cat cable going in and lots of fiber going in nowadays. Uh, and a lot of that is to future proof. Um, we've had clients say, what do I need all this fiber for? And we're like, well, right now with the technology you have, you don't. But in five years time, guaranteed you will. Yeah, everything. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when thinking, uh, talking about communications, when thinking about incorporating a integrated communication system into a venue, ha what what's, what's really important to you in the design process of that? Um, a lot of that, I think, depends on the venue itself. Um, so if we were doing a big multi-venue arts place like the Sydney Opera House or like um, Vic Art Centre or something like that, um, matrixing abilities, like abilities to, you know, call different venues and, um, software control of the overall system to be able to 
um, create call groups and all that kind of stuff is really important. Um, that becomes even more important, I think, in a post kind of COVID-19 world where more and more shows are going to be broadcast. So um, being able to communicate clearly and easily with broadcast people in the facility or outside of the facility or wherever they may be um, when you're doing a live show um, and having the ability in your comm system to be able to do that really easily and clearly um, and quickly, I think is really important. If you're doing a smaller venue, um, you know, say a more regional venue that's just like a 300 seat theater, most of that stuff is not necessarily important. And if we're going to be honest, those kind of venues won't have the budget to facilitate a comm system that does all that stuff. So then in that case, we'd be looking for a much more simple option, um, which is quite easy to do. And then, yeah, for bigger venues, things like Riddell, uh, you know, cat based technology, you can plug it in, you can make it work any way you need to work. And it's really easy to program. And um, yeah. <laughs> All right, Rich, thanks so much for your time. This has been a great chat. Uh, thank you for, for joining us here at Riedel today. And uh, thanks once again for your time. No worries. Thanks for having me.